For those of you who are not biologists, I want to very briefly explain to you why Bob Trivers is here tonight and why we are so excited to have him here. Because among today's students of animal behavior and evolutionary biology, there is hardly another name that is uh, more widely known. And Bob has uh, earned this popularity with five ideas that have been of the greatest importance for the development of the discipline of sociobiology, which is the evolutionary study of behavior. <clears throat> His ideas have inspired many behavioral ecologists and I think in retrospect to the extent that this is possible today, uh, most of their work has confirmed his main ideas. The first problem he focused on was how evolutionary theory could explain cooperation between individuals that are not related. And he came up with the idea of reciprocal altruism to solve this problem. His second insight deals with the way in which the traits of male and female animals are influenced by their investment in their offspring, hence the theory of parental care. A third hypothesis presented by him is the explanation of why certain species sometimes give birth to more young of the same sex. And so he gave birth to sex ratio theory, which has been a prominent body of theory in our field. He also, building upon his insights in, in parental care, uh, explained why conflicts often arise between older young and their parents, so-called parent-offspring conflict, something most of us in reproductive age are also uh, intimately familiar with. And finally, he predicted that the workers in an ant community, which are always female, may be expected to invest three times the amount of resources in bringing up their sisters than their brothers. And this is another facet of the uh, sex ratio adjustment uh, theory. More recently, Bob uh, has been very productive and prolific, and his work has result, resulted in an enormously uh, important and interesting book dealing with the biology of selfish genetic elements, and I think he spent about 10 years uh, writing on this one. And currently, that's also the reason why he is in Berlin, is working on a book on deceit and self-deception. I should also mention, I know that Bob is a shy and modest person, as you will see in a moment, but he is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He also won the Distinguished Animal Behaviorist Award of the Animal Behavior Society. And uh, last, but certainly not least, uh, in 2007, he was awarded the Crawford Prize for Biological Sciences by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences for his fundamental analysis of social evolution, conflict, and cooperation. And again, as the biologists among you know, the Crawford Prize is widely recognized as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for biologists. And with his tremendous uh, experience and creativity, Bob Trivers is the first person that came to mind when I thought about whom to invite to talk about Charles Darwin and his birthday today, and so it's a great pleasure to welcome Bob here, and I look forward to your thoughts entitled Remembering Charles Darwin. Bob.
He gave us our system of logic, the system of logic for all of biology. He spent his life developing its every application. We benefit from celebrating him and his life, and perhaps we also benefit from identifying with a great organism. He was born 200 years ago today, along with another great human being, Abraham Lincoln, a coincidence out of which I will make nothing. Um, I will take first his, his work, which was really his life, and then talk about his life. Um, for his work, I'll start out, of course, with evolution by natural selection, and then the problems that he thought were most serious about it and how he went about dealing with these problems. Then I'll discuss briefly his emphasis on behavior uh, throughout his work and why behavior is so central to evolutionary theory and why we who study animal behavior should bear this connection, I think, always in mind. And then, as I say, I will turn to the details of his life and then we will, with the help of this orchestra, sing Happy Birthday, I believe in English. And I will render it first, briefly, and then we will all do it together, if that's all right. So, the system of logic he gave us, of course, is evolution through natural selection. And this meant biological change over time, eventually so systematic that it extends three billion years backwards in time and to organisms smaller and less uh, sophisticated than bacteria. By natural selection, we refer to the mechanism by which evolutionary change took place, and that was simply differential reproductive success, where reproductive success is the number of offspring uh, that you produce. So some individuals leave many surviving offspring, and others fewer none. Could I have that? Thanks. And the, tra and the traits of those that leave many surviving offspring become more numerous over time. So in this view, what are organisms trying to do after three billion years of natural selection? They're trying to maximize their reproductive success. There's only been one change, one slight change in our understanding of natural selection. It's a natural extension of, of um, his argument, and he would have pointed it out himself if he understood genetics, which he did not. And that extension was simply to say, well, we're not only related to our children, we are equally related to our full siblings, brothers and sisters through both parents, and therefore, from the standpoint of natural selection, as is Gansi Gal, whether you have one more child or add one more brother or sister to the world. So reproductive success was expanded to include 